Yo, what's good? We're back. 12 Rules for Life. Jordan Peterson. We're still in chapter one. The chapter, uh, each chapter is a bit, you know, dense. <laughs> um, so yeah, apologies. <clears throat> Rising up. Sometimes people are bullied because they can't fight back. This can happen to people who are weaker physically than their opponents. This is one of the most common reasons for the bullying experienced by children. Even though the toughest of six-year-olds is no match for someone who is nine. So even the toughest of six-year-olds is no match for someone who is nine. A lot of that power differential disappears in adulthood, however, with the rough stabilization and matching of physical size, with the exception of that pertaining to men and women, with the former typically larger and stronger, particularly in the upper body, as well as the increased penalties generally applied in adulthood to those who insist upon continuing with physical in intimidation. But just as often, people are bullied because they won't fight back. This happens not infrequently to people who are by temperament compassionate and self-sacrificing, particularly if they are also high in negative emotion and make a lot of gratifying noises of suffering when someone sadistic confronts them. Children who cry more easily, for example, are more frequently bullied. It also happens to people who have decided, for one reason or another, that all forms of aggression, including even feelings of anger, are morally wrong. I have seen people with a particularly acute sensitivity to petty tyranny and over-aggressive competitiveness restrict within themselves all the emotions that might give rise to such things. Often they are the people whose fathers, sorry, often they are people whose fathers who were excessively angry and controlling. Psychological forces are never unidimensional in their value, however, and truly appalling potential, sorry, I'm reading with the book down because I'm cautious of it blocking the mic, but I'm just going to have to turn to the side a little bit. Uh, where was I? Psychological forces are never unidimensional in their value, however, and truly appalling potential of anger and aggression to produce cruelty and mayhem are balanced by the ability of those primordial forces to push back against oppression, speak truth, and motivate resolute movement forward in times of strife, uncertainty, and danger. With their capacity for aggression, straight-jacketed, within a too narrow morality, those who are only or merely compassionate and self-sacrificing and naive and exploitable cannot call, forth the gen cannot call forth the genuinely righteous and appropriately self-protective anger necessary to defend themselves. If you can bite, you generally don't have to. When skillfully integrated, the ability to respond with aggression and violence decreases then increases the probability that actual aggression will become necessary. If you say no early in the cycle of oppression and you mean what you say, which means you state your refusal in no uncertain terms and stand behind it, then the scope for oppression on the part of the oppressor will remain properly bounded and limited. The forces of tyranny expand inexorably to fill the space made for, the exi for their existence. People who refuse to muster appropriately self-protective territorial responses are laid open to exploitation as much as those who genuinely can't stand up for their own rights because of a more essential inability or true imbalance of power. Naive, harmless people usually guide their perceptions and actions with a few simple axioms. People are basically good. No one really wants to hurt anyone else. The threat, and certainly the use of force, physical or otherwise, is wrong. These axioms collapse, or worse, in the presence of individuals who are genuinely malevolent. Worse means that naive beliefs can become a positive invitation to abuse, because those who aim to harm have become specialized to prey on people who think precisely such things. Under such condi conditions, the axioms of harmlessness must be retooled. 
In my clinical practice, I often draw the attention of my clients to think that good people never become angry to stark realities of their own resentments. No one likes to be pushed around, but people often put up with it for too long. So, I get them to see their resentment, first as anger, and then as an indication that something needs to be said, if not done, not least because honesty demands it. Then I get them to see such action as part of the force that holds tyranny at bay, at, at the social level, as much as the individual. Many bureaucracies have petty authoritarians within them, generating unnecessary rules and procedures simply to express and cement power. Such people produce powerful undercurrents of resentment around them, which, if expressed, would limit their expression of pathological power. It is in this manner that the willingness of the individual to stand up for him or herself protects everyone from the corruption of society. When naive people discover the capacity for anger within themselves, they are shocked, sometimes severely. A profound example that can be found in the susceptibility of new soldiers to post-traumatic stress disorder, which often occurs because of something they watch themselves doing rather than because of something that has happened to them. They react like monsters. They can truly be in extreme battlefield conditions, and the revelation of that capacity undoes their world. And no wonder, perhaps they assumed that all of history's terrible perpetrators were people totally unlike themselves. Perhaps they were never able to see within themselves the capacity for oppression and bullying, and perhaps not only their capacity for assertion and success as well. I have had clients who were terrified into literally years of daily hysterical convulsions by the sheer look of malevolence on their attacker's face. Such individuals typically come from hyper-sheltered families where nothing terrible is allowed to exist and everything is fairyland or wonderful or else. When the awakening occurs, when once naive people recognize in themselves the seeds of evil and monstrosity, they see themselves as dangerous, at least potentially, their fear decreases. They develop more self-respect, then perhaps they begin to resist oppression. They see that they see that they have the ability to withstand because they are terrible too. They see they can, they can and must stand up because they begin to understand how genuinely monstrous they will become, otherwise feeding on their resentment, transforming it into the most destructive of wishes. To say it again, there is very little difference between the capacity for mayhem and destruction, integrated and the strength of character. This is one of the most difficult, life, difficult lessons of life. Maybe you are a loser. And maybe you're not. But if you are, you don't have to continue in that mode. Maybe you just have a bad habit. Maybe you're even just a collector of bad habits. Nonetheless, even if you came by your poor posture honestly, even if you were unpopular or bullied at home or in grade school, it is not necessarily appropriate now. Circumstances change. If you slumped around, with the same bearing that, ca that characterizes a defeated lobster, people will assign you a lower status. And the old counter that you share with crusta crustaceans sitting at the base of your brain will assign you a low dominance number. Then your brain will not produce as much serotonin. This will make you less happy and more anxious and sad and more likely to back down when you should stand up for yourself. It will also decrease the probability that you will get to live in a good neighborhood, have access to the highest quality resources, and obtain a healthy, desirable mate. It will render you more likely to abuse cocaine and alcohol as you live for the present in a world full of uncertain futures. It will, it will increase your susceptibility to heart disease, cancer, and dementia. All in all, it is not just good. Is that going to... Yeah, there we go. All in all, it's just not good. Circumstances change and so can you. Positive feedback loops 
adding effect to effect can spiral counterproductively in a negative direction, but can also work to get you ahead. That's the other, far more optimistic lesson of Price's Law and the Pareto distribution. Those who start to, ha- start to have will probably get more. Some of these upwardly moving loops can occur in your own private, subjective space. Alterations in body language offer an important example. If you are asked by a researcher to move your facial mus- muscles one at a time into a position that would look sad to an observer, you will report feeling sadder. If you are asked to move the muscles one by one into a position that looks happy, you will report feeling happier. Emotion is partly bodily expression and can be amplified or dampened by that expression. Some of the positive feedback loops instantiated by body language can occur beyond private confines of subjective experience in the social space you share with other people. If your posture is poor, for example, if you slump your shoulders forward and rounded, chest tucked in, head down looking small, defeated and ineffectual, protected in theory against attack from behind, then you will feel small, defeated and ineffectual. The reactions of others will amplify that. People, like lobsters, size each other up, partly in consequence of stance. If you present yourself as defeated, then people will react to you as if you are losing. If you straighten up, then people will look and treat you differently. You might object, the bottom is real. Being at the bottom is equally real. A mere transformative transformation of posture is insufficient to change anything that is fixed. If you are in number 10 positions, then standing up straight and appearing dominant might only attract the attention of those who want, once again, to put you down. And fair enough, but standing up straight with your shoulders back is not something that is only physical because it's not only a body. You're a spirit, so to speak, a psyche as well. Standing up physically also implies and invokes and demands standing up metaphysically. Standing up means voluntarily accepting the burden of being. Your nervous system responds in an entirely different manner when you face the demands of life voluntarily. You respond to a challenge instead of bracing for a catastrophe. You see the gold the dragon hoards instead of shrinking in terror from the all too real fact of the dragon. You step forward to take your place in the dominance hierarchy and occupy your territory, manifesting your willingness to defend, expand and transform it. That can all occur practically or symbolically, in a physical or as a conceptual restructuring. Trying to keep an eye on the time, sorry guys. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is to accept the terrible responsibility of life with eyes wide open. It means deciding to voluntarily transform the chaos of potential into the realities of habitable order. It means adopting the burden of self-conscious vulnerability and accepting the end of the unconscious practice of childhood, where finitude and morality are only dimly comprehended. It means willingly undertaking the sacrifices necessary to generate a productive and meaningful reality. It means acting to please God in the ancient language. To stand up straight with your shoulders back means building the ark that presents the world from the flood, guiding your people through the desert after they have escaped tyranny, making your way from comfortable home and country and speaking the prophetic word to those who ignore the widows and children. It means shouldering the cross that marks the X, the place where you and being intersect so terribly. It means casting dead, rigid and too too tyrannical order back into the chaos in which it was generated. It means withstanding the ensuing uncertainty and establishing, in consequence, a better, more meaningful and more productive order. So, attend more carefully your posture. Quit drooping and hunching around. Speak your mind. 
Put your desires forward as if you had a right to them. At least the same right as others. Walk tall and gaze forthrightly ahead. Dare to be dangerous. Encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways for its calming influence. People, including yourself, will start to assume that you are competent and able. Or at least they will not immediately conclude the, res- the reverse. Emboldened by the positive responses you are now receiving, you will begin to be less anxious. You will then find it easier to pay attention to the subtle social clues and the people ex- the subtle social clues that people exchange when they are communicating. Your conversations will flow better with fewer awkward pauses. This will make you more likely to meet people, interact with them and impress them. Doing so will not only go- will not only genuinely increase the po- probability of good doing so will not only genuinely increase the probability that good things will happen to you, it will also make those good things feel better when they do happen. Thus, being strengthened and emboldened, you may choose to embrace being and work for its furtherance and improvement. Thus strengthened, you may be able to stand, even during the illness of a loved one, even during the death of a parent, and allow others to find strength alongside you when they would otherwise be overwhelmed with despair. Thus emboldened, you will embark on the voyage of your life. Let your light shine, so to speak, on the heavenly hill, and pursue your rightful destiny. Then the meaning of your life may be sufficient to keep the corrupting influence of mortal despair at bay. Then you may be able to accept the terrible burden of the world and find joy. Look for your inspiration to the victorious lobster with his 350 million years of practical wisdom. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. So we're coming in tomorrow or next whenever I upload this, I'm probably going to upload it straight away. Rule two, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. So, long story short, what did that tell us? It kind of told us that losing is something that we get used to. That when you win, you kind of get used to winning and you keep winning. And if you let yourself lose, then you're probably going to keep losing. This whole paragraph kind of can be broken down into the old saying of fake it till you make it. Um... I kind of love that saying because, you know, while yes, I am a, an extremely confident person, um, if I don't know something, quite often I pretend that I know it. I know what's going on and I know what's happening. And very quickly I, I adjust and I know what I'm meant to be doing and I pick up what's happening. So fake it till you make it. Be confident. The first thing you have to do is stand up straight, shoulders back, be confident. You know, I was listening to a TED Talk ages ago. I showed one of my classes ages ago. And they said one of the like best ways to get your body to feel confident is to sit in a confident position. They said that this was the most confident way to sit. So do you. Don't let other people call your shots. Don't let other people make you who you are. You are you. You call your own shots. Be confident. Have faith in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, no one's going to believe in you. In any case, thank you all for watching. I'll catch you guys with chapter two next time. See you soon.